Good morning. Welcome to Grace Church. Let's worship together.
Heavenly Father, we're glad to be in your presence this morning. Again, we're scattered, but together we are with you. Wherever any one of us might be worshiping, however many might be in that uh, living room or den or dining room table, you are present. And you are not a little God. You are the creator of the universe. You are not weak or slow or uncaring. And you are not distant. And so when we turn our minds and, and, and say to ourselves again, it's time to worship. That's just an expression of our limitations, not yours. Be present with your people this morning, we pray. Let us worship you in spirit and in truth. Let us be focused on who you are so that we might worship you as you deserve. And then, Lord, leave the rest to your grace and your time. Amen. Well, again, I want to say to you this morning, I'm glad that you're able to worship with us um, through the TV ministry. Uh, we have some wonderful and faithful members of that ministry who come every week and make it possible. And of course, uh, Joe and Debbie are here with music every week. And uh, we're grateful for all of those ministries and we're grateful that you are with us this morning. Remember, we're not watching TV and we're not performing for TV. We're worshiping together. And even though... There is distance between us, and we're connected uh, by TV cable. We're also connected by the Holy Spirit's presence. So let us worship the Lord with joy and confidence and expectation. Join me in the call to worship, if you will. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ died and rose to redeem us from the guilt of sin and free us from the power of sin to dominate our lives. His new life in us gives us the desire and power to live in new ways. He calls us to live in love. The Holy Spirit makes His love grow within us. As we celebrate Mother's Day, we rejoice that the risen Lord gives life to our homes. Christ is risen. We receive and rejoice in his new life. Christ is risen indeed. Join us in singing the first hymn this morning, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, number 384 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Uh, the words for this uh, hymn will be on the screen for you.
Join me in the prayer that you will find on the screen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are the creator of all things, the creator of the human family, for you created us male and female. We acknowledge and praise you for the gift of marriage, of children, the gift of motherhood. We ask you to bring renewed blessing to our families in all its forms and pray for families across our country and around the world. As you have given us the perfect example of love in Jesus Christ, grant us new hearts that we may live by his example, confessing our failures and committing ourselves to his model each new day through Christ who revealed love to us. Amen. And join me in the Survivor's Creed by Max Lucado. And let's remember that God is seeing us through this. I'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. But God will use this mess for good. In the meantime, don't be foolish or naive, but don't despair either. With God's help, I will get through this.
It's Mother's Day, and we want to acknowledge the mothers who are worshiping with us this morning. Um, I'd like to read a tribute to mothers from a man named Jeffrey Lichen. Uh, he is a psychologist, and he writes about Mother's Day uh, from having observed his own wife with their daughter. He writes, Today is Mother's Day. I wanted to write a tribute to mothers everywhere. I hope you enjoy this piece. So what is a mother really? Sure, one becomes a mom the moment she bears or adopts children and assumes the responsibility of raising kids. But that is the technical answer. And while it is accurate, it is missing something. I remember when my wife was pregnant and her motherly biology began to kick in. She could hear things no one else could hear, smell things no one else could smell, feel things no one else seemed to feel. Her full biological capacity as a woman kicked into high gear. Her sensory awareness was almost otherworldly, and every mom I've ever spoken to tells me similar stories. Biologically, this makes sense. A mother needs to be able to notice all the most subtle details to attend to the primal means through which a newborn communicates. They often call this motherly instinct. And sure, dads can learn many of these things too, but we must learn it. Mothers just do it. As the months began to become years and our daughter's baby babble became constant chatter, the need for constant attention gave way to the desire for independence, free play, and the time and room for my wife to attend to her own needs, regular workouts at the gym, uh, making plans with friends. But the moment a mother is required, everything else gets dropped with no hesitation, no complaint, and no resistance. There's nothing more important in the world than to be a mother. On St. Patrick's Day, the teachers in nursery school told the kids a magical story and then gave colorful bead necklaces to each child. One by one, the children reached into a bag and took out one. You get what you get and don't throw a fit was their policy. Well, my daughter reached in and pulled out a green necklace but what she really wanted was a purple one. She was so disappointed, but she held it together, not saying a word and not throwing a fit. When the door opened and the children came outside after school that day, they ran out with their necklaces flashing. My daughter came out with her green one. I knelt down for her to run into my arms as she does every day at pickup, but instead she ran right by me and jumped into her mother's arms, burying her little face in her mother's shoulders and blubbering away about how disappointed she was that she did not get a purple necklace. She didn't complain, she didn't pout. My wife hardly said a word. Instead, she just sent the message the way only a mother can do, letting every cell in her being resonate the most important message of all, you are okay. All is okay. Even in your tears and disappointment, you are okay. She held our little one and let her tears get absorbed into her blouse, the way so many mothers' clothes have been uh, throughout all history, all over the globe. And in a few moments, the tears were gone, the smiles returned, and we were on our way home. For my wife and daughter, they were already home. Home is being a mom. Home is soaking in the nurturing reassurance that only a mom can give in this way that speaks so deeply and completely to a child in a language that is as old as time and that cannot be captured in writing or words. I thought about what had just happened and how many times it happens. This is the way nature works. 
and the way God intended it to be. It's biological, and yet it is also something else. It is, it is how biology merges with something so much greater and bigger than any one of us. I like to think of it as biology and soul. When combined in just the right way, we have a mother. And today is a day to honor mothers, nature's perfect mix of biology and soul. So here is to mothers, our own, our children's, and all the mothers in the world. Happy Mother's Day to all. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the light of what we've just read and what we've been thinking about, uh, we know that there are lots of emotions and sentiments stirred in our hearts. There might be small children at home that have heard those words and snuggled up with their mom just a little bit closer. There are others of us whose mothers are gone, and yet we think about their kindness, their love, their patience, and the times when patience wore thin, as it should. We know that there are some whose relationship with their mother was broken in some way. Some who lost their mother early in life and missed that person. And so while there is joy on Mother's Day, there's also sorrow. And we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. We thank you, Lord, for uh, birth moms, for adoptive moms, for family members who uh, serve as moms, for foster moms, step moms. And we ask, Lord, that your grace would help them to be the best moms that they can. None of us is perfect. No mother ever does a perfect job. So help our mothers not to be self-condemning, but instead to rejoice in the possibilities that are before them and in the sure knowledge that your grace is made perfect in our weakness. Now, that's not an excuse, but it is a great hope. Lord, we're continuing to pray in the face of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. There are needs around the world. There are uh, countries where the virus is spreading rapidly now and other places where the virus is coming under control. Here in our own country, we're wrestling with how do we restore something closer to normal and still keep the virus at bay. We're missing gathering in our churches, and we want to, we want to be back together. So, Lord, we lift all these needs and, and sorrows before you, we pray for those who've lost loved ones. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are serving uh, the sick, uh, medical uh, personnel, uh, including uh, custodians and, and uh, kitchen staff and all the other support people that keep the medical system operating. And for first responders who step in uh, at their own risk and because we have a need. 
We pray for our leaders. And as the responsibility of opening things again shifts more and more to governors, we lift them before you. We pray for Governor Wolf. We pray for our president and vice president and the staff in the White House. We understand that there are uh, members of the staff who have tested positive for the coronavirus. Lord, we haven't prayed for our service men and women for some time. We lift those before you who are at home, who are abroad, and ask that your grace would sustain them, especially those who are serving uh, in areas of, of risk and maybe uh, direct conflict. And Lord, we ask that your grace would empower our souls in this time of unusual hardship. Your kingdom is real. And we ask that you would work in us in such a way that your kingdom within our soul will grow right now and through these weeks that we have been uh, sheltering in place that we would shelter under the shadow of your wings, as the Psalms say. That you would grant us hope in the waiting, uh, peace in uncertainty, steadfast, steadfastness under pressure, and open dependence on our dependable God. Lord, we lift before you uh, those who are sick. John is recovering. Uh, Jan, Lois, Joanne, there are others. Those at home are lifting up their friends, their family. Uh, we don't pray just for medical needs. There are other kinds of needs, so many other human needs. But we lift these people before you. We name them. We ask your mercy and grace, and power, and healing. And we give you thanks for hearing us and for our brothers and sisters who, even though they don't hear those prayers, they say amen with us. And we give you our thanks, Lord. We love you because you have loved us. We worship you because you are the only worthy God. We rejoice in your presence. Thank you. And together we pray that prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're at home. The offering plate isn't going to pass in front of us, but we worship our God with our substance. I want you to hear these words from Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus said... Who then is the faithful and wise servant? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing his master's will when he comes. We are not together to offer those gifts, but let us offer ourselves and the gifts that we are giving, one way or another, to the Lord.
Almighty God, we enjoy the abundance of your goodness, food and shelter, clothing and comforts, peace and security. Out of your abundance, we bring this offering and our worship. Grant us grace to see physical and spiritual needs around us and the compassion to imitate Christ in our response. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. The scripture this morning is 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, just a p- short portion of this uh, personal letter uh, to a young man named Timothy, who Paul considered his son in the, son in the faith. Uh, they were close, and, uh, and Paul writes this letter to Timothy as personal instruction and encouragement, and we get those same things as we listen in. So let's give our attention to God's Word in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. I thank God whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What a treasure we have in your book, in your words. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us to hear well so that we can both understand and desire your will and then do it. Help us to be disciples of Christ true followers. It's in his name we pray. Amen. It was Mother's Day and a congregation was celebrating uh, by recognizing mothers in the church um, according to different categories, I guess you'd say. So they, so they asked the newest mom, Uh, who was present and someone was identified and they presented her with flowers and then they asked for the mom who lived closest to the church and the mom who traveled the farthest uh, to come to the church and they recognized the mom with the most daughters and the most sons and the most children they recognized adoptive uh, moms and foster moms and finally they wanted to honor the oldest mother in the congregation. A stately white-haired woman rose and received the last bouquet as another mom turned to her husband and whispered, darn it, she was older than me last year too. We're discovering uh, as a society how utterly indispensable parents are and especially moms. There is no one else who can make children into healthy adults. And whether moms are biological, uh, adoptive, uh, extended family, serving as parents, step, uh, step parents, step moms, uh, foster moms, whatever it is, um, moms are unique. And that's why on Mother's Day I want to say to you, moms, and to all of us. You can't do better than that. 
Imagine a class reunion. You may have gone to several of them uh, yourself, but you know what it's like. Everybody is comparing notes, what their experiences have been, and, and uh, all this. So there's this kind of evaluating of success going on. So one person will say, well, I'm a lawyer. And another person will say, well, I'm a doctor. A third person will say, I'm a surgeon. And the fourth will say, well... I'm a brain surgeon. And all of that is about saying, I, I can do one better than you. Now, I want you to imagine that a woman steps into this circle and says, I can beat you all. I'm a mom, and you can't do better than that. Is that how we, we look at motherhood? Uh, as, as the top ranking accomplishment uh, and, and operation in the world. Um, society has a way of placing a lot of things ahead of being a mom. Now, that doesn't mean that moms can't do a lot of things. It just means that being the mom, doing the job of a mom, is so critical. Meyer Francis Nimkoff has said, science has established two facts meaningful for human welfare. First, the foundation of human personality is laid down in early childhood. And second, the chief engineer of this construction is the family. And Paul writes here to Timothy, as I said before, uh, a, a younger man, uh, someone that Paul uh, has been mentoring, and he really feels like uh, Timothy is the son he never had. Um, he's not specifically writing about family life here, but he says some things that are important that we can apply to our families. So um, Paul talks about faith, and he says these three things about it. Faith must be passed on. Faith must be encouraged. And faith must be acted upon. So if you'll uh, look with me at uh, verses 3 and 5, you'll read these words. In verse 3, uh, I thank God whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. And then in verse 5, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. So the first thing is, faith must be passed on. Well, come on, let's do this right. Passed on. Faith has to be passed on. Um, uh, Paul gratefully acknowledges here his own heritage of faith. Um, and he also says to Timothy, you have a heritage of faith. Uh, faith resided in your grandmother Lois. Your mother Eunice, uh, their sincere faith was real. And now I'm persuaded, Paul says, that that sincere faith is in you as well. The point is that Paul and Timothy were exposed to faith from their heritage, from their family. You know, we all receive uh, faith from someone. I remember um, Marilyn Brown, who was a Sunday school uh, teacher in the church I attended when I was a child in, in Milford, Indiana. A pastor named uh, Reverend Richard Summers, Sumners, uh, who was pastor there. Uh, Dave Beam, who was a classmate of mine in high school and was instrumental in leading to me to personal faith. I have attended church all my life, and I am glad that I did because the church 
planted seeds. But, like everyone, I had to receive those seeds and accept Christ for myself. And these people and others, and especially my mother and father, were instrumental in planting those seeds of faith. You have people like that in your life, people who planted seeds of faith, people who brought the faith to you. And you can be that person in your child's life, the person who plants the seeds of the gospel, who passes on the faith to them. Passes on the faith deliberately, not like, not like weeds springing up on their own in the flower bed, but something that is planted deliberately and with desire because the crop is what is, is sought. And that's the way we need to look at passing on Christian faith to our kids. A living relationship with Jesus Christ passed on to our children. Your kids do not have faith from birth. Faith is not the natural human preset. Now, as young children, they'll mimic your faith, but they have to come to a real faith of their own. And that means that faith must be passed on. And parents, you have that great joy and opportunity to be the one who passes on faith to your kids. The second thing uh, Paul writes here in verse 6. He says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. The second thing that Paul says is that faith must be encouraged. Faith has to be encouraged. So he writes to Timothy, fan the flame, build it up, make it warmer. It's one thing to plant a seed, it's another to harvest a crop. It's one thing to start a campfire, and it's another thing to keep it going. Have you ever noticed that if you're out on a summer night, and uh, well, you, it's before you had to be six feet apart, uh, you're actually enjoying uh, being around close to each other in the fire, and it kind of burns down, and then somebody throws more logs in it, and it comes back up, and it burns down. And Both cases, whether it's a seed or a fire, success requires constant attention. Faith is the same. Faith has to be encouraged. Uh, young children um, accept what they're what their parents and other adults tell them uh, almost unquestioningly. Uh, it's just part of the way children are made. And sometimes parents make the mistake of, of seeing that in their young children and, and thinking that that is the kind of faith that's going to see them through the rest of their life. So the kid likes to go to Sunday school and comes home and tells you Bible stories and maybe even volunteers to say grace at the table. And we think, oh, well, I've heard parents come up to me and say, I think so-and-so is going to be a preacher because, and then they tell me stuff. And that's great. That's wonderful. It means some please, seeds are being planted. But sometimes, well, all the time, uh, parents need to keep nurturing that. Because you've got to remember that as that child grows up and he comes into adolescence, they're not only going to say to their parent, um, you're always wrong and I'm always right. Uh, I remember uh, walking in the mall and our daughter wanted to be a hundred yards ahead so that no one would know that she was connected to us. I'm sure I did the same thing, although we didn't have malls at that time. I'm sure I did the same thing when I was that age because that's what kids do. They work on becoming independent. 
They also need to work on having an independent faith. And so, as parents, we pass it on and we encourage it to grow. They're going to ask you questions. Uh, They're going to ask other people questions about what we believe and why we believe it. They may ask those questions to you directly. More likely, they're going to ask those questions indirectly by resisting uh, the things that they used to participate in. Um, and, And you have the great job of encouraging their faith as it grows toward an adult faith. How do you do that? I think the most important thing is to start by listening to their questions. Um, Confident uh, that since faith is, uh, that there are answers, I'm sorry, confident that since there are answers to questions, you don't have to be afraid to ask those questions. Let them ask. Listen to them. Uh, Even encourage them by saying, okay, I, I hear your first thing, but can you tell me a little bit more about how you're thinking and how you're feeling so that they have a chance to open that and know that you're really listening. And then when it's your opportunity to speak, you might need to say, you know, that's a great question. I'm not sure I can answer it very well. Don't be afraid to say, I I don't know the answer. But then invite them to join you in discovering the answer to their question. It's okay not to know, but see, if they see you joining them in finding the answer, then they're going to realize that your faith is not just simply closing your eyes and believing in spite of not knowing, but your faith is founded on a sure foundation, reality, That your faith is in truth. What a profound impact that is going to have on so many kids. And then when you gradually discover those answers. And they're doing that discovery with you. You're going to be encouraging their faith. So, faith must be passed on. It has to be encouraged. And then the last thing... Uh, Paul points out to us is faith must be put into action. Faith has got to be put into action. Uh, Here in verse verse 7, Paul writes to Timothy, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love. And of self-discipline. See, the question here is timidity. That's the issue. Uh, Because timidity uh, can keep a sincere Christian from living effectively as a Christian. Timidity paralyzes us so we don't do what Christ wants us to do. And because we don't do what Christ wants us to do, we experience His love for us at a much lower level. And we don't experience his power in and through us hardly at all. So you got to put your faith into action. Don't be timid about it. Don't be rude about it, but don't be timid. God has given us a spirit of power and love and self-control. So how do you help your, uh, your daughter or your son put their faith into action. Well, uh, you can get them involved in how you put your faith into action. Um, When this shutdown is over and we can start returning to something more normal, why not get involved in mustard seed ministry? Uh, They do a lot of work with uh, helping homeowners who don't have the financial resources to, to make their home livable. Uh, so they do a lot of repair and construction. And if you were involved, you could, you could get your kids involved with you, helping that family, that person. Send them on a mission trip. 
uh, take them to a Christian uh, music festival, something like Creation. Mel and I took Lauren to, to the Creation Festival year after year after year. Uh, Kingdom Bound is another one that's in Darien Lake in, in New York, and uh, Alive is at Canton, Ohio. To see thousands of other Christians who are teens and college age mostly, and, and to hear God praised in music that is the language of their generation, and then just to enjoy the fun of that uh, atmosphere, really has an impact on kids. It's not the only thing they need to do, but it can have a wonderful impact on their faith. Let them help you serve when you serve. Last, last week, um, friends from our first church posted on Facebook some pictures of a project that uh, that church is doing right now. It was a drive through food distribution, and they were handing out uh, non-perishable food items, and they purchased some meats so that they could provide those to people. Um, they all were wearing masks, and they were giving out homemade masks to anybody that needed them. And in the pictures, there were our friends from so long ago, and there, of course, were some new people that we didn't recognize. And Laura Paleo was in those pictures because Laura is now the pastor of that church. And in the pictures, there were pictures of kids. And you could see the excitement in the adults as well as the kids that they were doing something that helped somebody in a real way. And that they were doing that in Jesus' name. If you can get your kids involved in putting their faith into action, it will make a difference in their lives. So, what are we saying? Faith must be passed on, and you can do that by how you live and what you say. It has to be encouraged. So you build, it, you build it up. You don't fear the questions your children ask, but you seek answers and you seek answers with them so that they discover answers are real. And then you put faith into action. When they see your faith lived, it will make a profound difference in their lives. Uh, I want to end with just some uh, interesting quotes about motherhood from children. Uh, why did God make mothers? Mainly to clean the house. Or because she's the only one who knows where the scotch tape is. Why did God give you your mother and not someone else's mom? Well, God knew she likes me a lot more than other kids' moms like me. What kind of little girl was your mother? I don't know because I wasn't there, but my guess would be she was pretty bossy. What ingredients does God use to make mothers? I lost my page. God makes Mothers out of angel hair and clouds and everything nice in the world and one dab of mean. Describe the world's greatest mom. She would make broccoli taste like ice cream. The greatest mom in the world would not make me kiss my fat ants. She would always be smiling and keep her opinions to herself. Well, I don't know if you can turn broccoli into ice cream or uh, keep your opinions to yourself. But moms, you are a treasure. Know that you are. And remember, you can pass on your faith. Encourage your children in their faith and help them put their faith into action. And when you do, that will have a profound effect upon their life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you've given us the family because uh, one generation needs the previous generation to bring it to fullness. 
We start out helpless. We be, grow into to innocence. Uh, we become uh, self-centered and rebellious. And gradually we begin to discover uh, responsibility and love for others and not just ourselves. And your love for us in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for every mom who is in the business of raising kids right now, that your grace would meet her need. Whether her child is an infant or getting ready to leave the nest, help that mom to be the best mom she can be. Help dads to be the best dad they can be. Lord, help us all to be the best people we can be and to know that we can pass on our faith. We can encourage our faith in others and we're called to put our faith into action regardless of whether we're moms or not. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we are going to sing... Um, a hymn called Happy the Home When God is There. We're going to use the tune of Amazing Grace in the United Methodist Hymnal. You'll find this at page or at number 445. Let's sing together Happy the Home When God is There. Thank you for joining us. Let's join together in the benediction. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good to do his will and work in you what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen.